Ahí va a llegar el gol del Arsenal Ophir. Attention a Nicolas Pepe, encore lui, voilà, qui crée des choses. Oh, oh, comme il ouvre bien ce pied, Nicolas Pepe, Nicolas Pepe, Nicolas Pepe, ça, ça va le rassurer. This is Arscast Extra. Hello and welcome to another Arscast Extra, as always, with James from Gunnerblog. James, goodly morning to you. Goodly morning to you too. How are you doing? I'm all right. What a week it's been for Arsenal. Thomas Partey makes his full debut. Knocks, knocks it out of the park. Mm-hmm. Uh, we win our first Europa League game. Brilliant away from home. And our new social media intern is just red hot. <laughs> yeah, Arsenal's social media game has stepped up a level with the, the signing of Mesut Ozil, <laughs> uh, whose minute-by-minute minute commentary on last night was a, a surreal sight, I think it's fair to say. Well, I didn't see it because I was doing my own live blog. So, of course. Um, well, yeah. I mean, it's... Competition in the market, Andrew. Now I feel like yeah, he might just have a bit more clout than me. You Perhaps. know, a few more followers, Perhaps. what have you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, uh, it was a dual screen experience for me. You know, I was kind of watching that uh, with with one eye and then the other on the game. Mm-hmm. Um, the Europa League. Have you missed it? Have I missed it? Uh, mm. There's a really good question. Actually, I thought <laughs> uh, if people haven't, and I'm sure people haven't, um, because it's one of those games which doesn't necessarily generate a huge amount of interest, but I would recommend going to Ars Blog News and reading Andrew Allen's match report uh, of the game, which I thought was very entertaining, probably more entertaining than the game itself. The final line of which is Europa League football. It's just as you remembered it. <laughs> it really is. It really is. And I have to say, despite my um, hyping up of the possibility of the atmosphere that the presence of some crowd might bring, uh, it felt, at least through my TV screen, that that sort of didn't remotely materialise. I thought, actually, I, I beg to differ slightly on that. Oh, really? I, thought, I thought there were some moments where, you know, they might boo an Arsenal player for doing something or, or you know, get behind their team a bit. I found it quite... Quite nice Cheering. to hear some real fans in the stadium again because, you know, we've discussed this, but I've been watching all the games without crowd noise where possible because I, I just can't deal with the fake crowd noise. So mm. I don't know if it was augmented because it sounded like there was more of them there than were actually in the stadium. Either that or they had the microphones turned on them completely and they'd done some kind of coordinated um, rehearsal about what they were going to sing and say and do during the game. But I, I quite liked it. I thought there were some moments where they were behind their team. There was a bit of booing of Arsenal players, you know, when we did things. I enjoyed that. So um, Maybe, look, you know what it is? What? Maybe it's that I've been, I've become so uh, lulled by the false crowd noise. Do you know what I mean? I've yeah. kind of been dining on a diet of fake crowd noise that the reality underwhelmed <laughs> Me. But yeah, I'm glad that you enjoyed it. Yeah, you're sitting there going, hey, why are these people not reacting to things after about two seconds? Yeah, why, why are, are they, they so doing quick it off the straight mark? away? What's happening it's here? This is, this is bullshit right here. Yeah. It's no, suspicious. Yeah, well, look, there you go. It was a little sidebar to, to what happened last night. Um, so, where do we start on this one? Uh, where, where do you feel like starting? I'll throw this over to you because. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily saying I'm I'm uninspired by what happened last night, but you know, sometimes <laughs> sometimes I feel like uh, you know you need a bit more responsibility on this podcast, so go for it. <laughs> well, I suppose what I feel is kind of like kind of the, the same as I felt about Arsenal for the majority of this season, really, which is that you know we looked increasingly. Uh, like there are things to be excited about or positive about in the sort of defensive third. Uh, And we weren't particularly inspiring, certainly not until that last 20 minutes or so in the final third. And, you know, I was hoping that playing some, I think we can call them inferior opposition, might kind of see us dominate the game more or create a lot more opportunities. Mm. And that didn't come to pass. So I suppose my sort of big takeout from it is I'm very glad we won the game. Um, And I'm encouraged by the fact that we, you know, we did get those goals. But 
there is that lingering concern for me of, you know, yeah. when is the magic going to start happening? <laughs> yeah, that is uh, has been a common theme, I think, in, in the analysis and some of the discussion that I've seen. And certainly I wrote about it in the blog today in terms of, you know, what we have to do next as part of our development under Mikel Arteta. And mm. I think we can all accept that there were things he had to put right and things he had to correct and lay foundations and everything else. But, you know, we're 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 bare walls and a roof, if you like, you know, it's time to start a little bit of decoration if we're going to use the, the old house analogy. Agree. Yeah. So uh, the thing, the thing that I sort of get stuck on is sort of wondering what is the appropriate time frame to kind of demand that in? Yeah. Do you that's, know what I mean? Yeah. I think that's, I think that's reasonable. I think it comes from the fact that people can see that things are better than they used to be when it comes to our defence and and how more secure we are as a team. And I say that after we conceded one of the most uh, insecure goals that we've conceded in a long time under Mikel Arteta or anybody else. So uh, I'm not uh, blind to that particular piece of irony. But I think in general, people can see that the many of the issues, if not all, not all of them, I mean, um, have been addressed. The things that he had to absolutely work on and get right from the start, he has made progress with those. So now I think people are saying, well, look, if we can do this, if we're capable of doing that, if we're not helter-skelter, if every opposition set piece doesn't make a shit our pants, if attacking the opposition goal doesn't mean that we're wide open and uh, easy to counter-attack against, you know, if we can uh, identify all those things, is it now not time to start adding some of the flourishes, you know, the the flooring, the wallpaper, whatever it might be, but sometimes it feels like Mikel Arteta is putting uh, wallpaper on the floor and, you know, tiles on the, you know, floor tiles on the walls and stuff. He, yeah, he's still like pouring cement into the basement in an attempt to provide like greater solidity mm. when really we do need uh, a bit of decoration like you like you put it i mean yeah. let's come back to that to go back to the very beginning what did you have any surprises in the team selection i mean i thought it was pretty much as i expected it to be sort of in that we played in Kedia in a position i didn't really expect him to play in yeah, yeah. You know, I, what I, do you w- mean? Le- out by the left touch line is the best position in our team. That's where we put our, our very best players. For, for a striker whose uh, cumulative, cumulative yardage when it comes to scoring goals is about three. You know, mm. he doesn't really crack them in from outside the box or he's not that kind of a player, is he? So I think that was a bit of a strange one to me, particularly as I think there was, um, there was another option. You know, a fairly obvious option for me would have been to play Maitland-Niles and Yusaka uh, as part of, uh, you know, that front three. Mm-hmm. So that mm-hmm. would that would have felt a little more, oh, look, we've got a window where a window should be and not a door kind of thing. Um, yeah. I'm not going to I'm not going to keep going on this house analogy. I'm sorry. I, I'm, you know, but no, it's fine. I, I'm not convinced by Nketiah in a wide role at all. I must say he came on, didn't he? At, at right wing, was it in the previous game mm. um, against Man City? I, I, I just don't see him flourishing out there. He is such a penalty box yeah. player. And it's more so than any other player we have. Isn't it, isn't it reasonable to say that he's, uh, you, you might not be convinced yet by him in his natural position? You know, I think, well, yeah. I, and that's not to be hugely critical. It, it, ju- it is what it is with a 21-year-old striker, a 21-year-old player. You know, he's he's still learning his trade. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I think that was a bit of an issue. Uh, I was glad to see Thomas Partey start, though, and I think that is probably going to be our big positive takeaway from this. Um, yeah. Unless there's something more you want to add to the front three discussion, which or we could come back no, to it when we talk about the subs. I, I mean, the chemistry wasn't right. It didn't really work in the front three. Yeah, I was really pleased to see Thomas Partey start. And, you know, granted, it's one game. Granted, it's the Europa League. I mean, I, I suppose the biggest compliment you can pay him, and I think it's something Owen Hargreaves said at half time, is that, you know, he looks like a Champions League player out there at the Europa League. It looked, you know, well below his level. And uh, mm. that's a, a positive, really, because that's the, the calibre of player we should be trying to sign. Yeah, for sure. You know, you can see what he brings. You can see the quality in there, the, the passing, the intent, the, the desire to get the ball forward. Uh, as much as possible, often first time as well, which I really liked because that sort of speed of transition helps when you're mm. trying to break down teams. So there was a there was a lot to like about his performance and you know what he can bring to this team. 
Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, that's him in the team now. You know, he's kind of shown he's up to speed. I think I think he'll play at the weekend and I think he should play. I think, I, I think defensively he was really good as well. I mean, there were a few instances there was a great sort of interception slash tackle on the edge of the box. Mm. Uh, a couple of headers that he won quite impressively. I, I just thought he looked really sharp and... Yeah, the, the passing, the progressive passing was a sort of pleasant surprise, really. I mean, I hoped that we would see that from him, but I wasn't necessarily sure. It's not something that he was called upon to do enormously at Atletico Madrid. He was kind of the guy, the give it and get it guy. Um, but he looks like he does have that in his locker, and that is something that we, we desperately need. I mean, when we get onto our attack and our problems in the final third. I do think that, you know, the way we pass the ball from the midfield is kind of as, as big a contributor as anything else. What what exactly do you mean? Well, I, I think if you look at the winning goal, just to jump ahead, the pass that Mohamed El Nenny plays, the forward intent that's in that pass, it's remarkable in that it's not something we see that frequently from our collection of central midfield players. And I don't believe that, say, a Granit Xhaka or a Danny Ceballos doesn't have the technical quality or the imagination to play that pass. Mm. But I think that there are two things that stop it happening. I think one is we don't have good enough movement in the final third. I yeah. don't think they're, the running off the ball is there to, to provide uh, you know, targets for those passes. And I do just think there is a sort of question of intent. I do think that it, there's such a focus on stability and shape that maybe we can be a little bit risk averse in possession. And yeah. as great a pass as that is, it's very, very, very nearly intercepted. You know, a guy mm. almost gets a foot to it. And that's kind of the game you have to play to be progressive and to be attacking. Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with that. I think we are a little bit cautious. I do think as well, there is an element of, it is difficult to break down a team which is sitting deep and which is organised. And they were organised quite well last night. Yeah, you know, I'm not saying sure. they're a brilliant team or anything else, but, you know, at this level, um, any half-decent coach can get a, good, uh, a team organised and, and sit off and keep your shape and make it difficult. And, you know, we do lack some of those players in the team. You know, when you've got a striker on the left wing, a striker who I think is really struggling in Lacazette, mm -hmm. um who looks like he's struggling physically to me um, to do the things that, as we discussed on the last podcast, that Mikel Arteta seems to want from his centre forward. Mm. You know, I, I do think it's not quite as easy as just saying, look, we should play uh, with more uh, intent or what have you. I think I think the, the issue of movement is a really big one because you could see the difference when uh, Aubameyang and, and Bellerin came on. Um, yeah. Look, you can't really say it's an inspired substitution, can you? When you take off two players and put on two much, much better players. It's not <laughs> right. really like, well, this is a piece of uh, chicanery that the nobody would have expected. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's pretty easy. And I know it was that the game state plays a part as well in that, you know, it was getting on uh, and there's elements of fatigue in the other team maybe not. Uh, being able to maintain their focus and concentration and, and positional discipline, et cetera, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think that issue of movement is a is a really is a really big one because you could see what happened when when those two players came on and immediately we looked better, brighter, sharper, and found space. Yeah, and I think your point about the Lacazette is a really good one. I mean, he's clearly a player who, even though he's got a few goals early in the season, is is well short of form. I actually think that's actually a sort of broader point about our attacking play as well. How many of our attacking players could you mm. say were in good form? Um, and I know these things all feed into each other. They are all connected and all related. But, um, you know, I mean, apart from Bukai Saka, I think it, it becomes very difficult. Okay, so here's a broad question then, not necessarily specific to last night. Mm. If we as fans look at this team and acknowledge that the next step is to be more potent, be more effective as an attacking unit. Mm. Do we not have to acknowledge, or how will I say this, that, that a consistent part of what we've done under Mikel Arteta to get to where we are, to get to the point where we want this, has been with a striker like... Lacazette or like Inketia, 
playing that particular role and that in order to improve, we have to do something different with that position, with that space on the pitch, uh, because ultimately what those players can give us is part of the reason why we're not quite as good as an attacking unit as people want. I think that what I think about that is that ideally you'd have a better centre forward there. But we do have one. We do have one. We don't have to go to the market. We have one. No. But if you ask me in my ideal world, I would have someone who's better at doing the things Lacazette can do and Aubameyang playing from the left. That's my ideal world. But But we don't have that. But why would your ideal world not be Aubameyang playing in the position where he is best and somebody who could do more from the left or from the right. Does that not make more sense given our squad makeup right now and the 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 ability that we have to bring in players in the transfer market? You know, it, it strikes me that the solution is there right in front of us. So, uh, you know, the, the ideal world for me would be getting the best out of a, a striker, particularly one of Aubameyang's age. We mm-hmm. have to acknowledge that aspect of it too. Yeah, I do think that people are forgetting the games Aubameyang plays up top through the middle where he doesn't get a kick. And we go, we haven't got an out ball. We haven't got anyone who can hold it. And we did have game quite a lot of games like that. And I'm not saying every game, but sometimes. And I do think that having a... Listen, it's just a purely subjective thing. Mm. I prefer a structural centre-forward with runners off them. That's just how... You know, if I if I was a football manager, and thankfully I'm not, but if I was, that was probably that would be how I'd get my team to play. It's how Liverpool play a lot of the time, and I think they do it exceptionally well. Mm. So, you know, in both instances, in my opinion, we're saying we're saying we want something we haven't got. I mean, you're saying I wish we had a wide player who could, you know, allow Aubameyang to play through the middle and provide masses of productivity. I think we've got that. We don't know that. We don't. I don't think. Okay, for sure we don't know it. But I think Bakayo Saka, coming off a, a debut season with twelve assists, has demonstrated that he is capable. Uh, is he young? Is he still raw? Is he still inexperienced? Can games pass him by a little? Absolutely, absolutely. But I think the the player is there. Um, I know we've also got Martinelli on the left. Yeah, I think he will be there. I'm not sure he's there right now. I mean, uh, you know... Well, I, who was our best player against Man City? Uh, probably Saka. Yeah. But... Uh, you know, so I I, I think we are um, within this system or with the players that we have to play in the system that Arteta wants or what he wants from his centre forward. I think we are basically swimming against the tide if we want the kind of improvement that we want to see from an attacking point of view. And the solution for me, based on what we've got in the squad, is doing something different. Because I think the the I think the fundamentals are there. I think the, the foundations are pretty much there. I think the spine has been strengthened with Gabriel. I think the spine has been strengthened with Thomas Partey. And now I think it's time to look at doing something different from an attacking perspective, because we don't have enough shots, we don't create enough, and if we're talking about movement being key to creating chances, there is literally nobody better in our team than Aubameyang to make those runs and to find those spaces and to get on the end of things. Um, Someone did a great clip of Willian during the Man City game, where there are a couple of moments where he had the opportunity to make a run into space which could have created chances for us, but because he's not a striker, he didn't do it. And I wonder if, James, part of the reason why we're sometimes a little cautious or uh, unproductive from midfield is because the players in those positions aren't looking for players who can make the runs that Obama Yang might make. So if you get an Aubameyang in there who's going to play on the shoulder of the defender or run between defenders or or look for the ball that's curled in behind, then maybe the the passing and maybe the uh, the chance creation from midfield and from those areas starts to improve. 
Maybe, maybe. I mean, I, I, I'm not convinced, to be honest. Like, it, it, it's possible. But I think that it's, it's very easy to go, well, what we're doing isn't working, therefore the other thing will. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's, uh, well, what else do you do? <laughs> well, you can change it with... You can change the way you play... Sure. ...without changing... I suppose the question is, you know, you say the fundamentals are in place, but I think it's sort of clear that Arteta views... At the moment, he v- views the role of the centre-forward as one of those fundamentals... Because he never changes it. Mm. So if the fundamentals and the structure are there, maybe that is part of his envisaged structure. Mm. Maybe so. Maybe so. Anyway, look, that's just my two cents. Uh, that's just the, the way I look at it at the moment. Um, I think that if we are going to improve from an attacking point of view, we've got to do something different. Um, and maybe that's maybe that's playing somebody else in midfield maybe that's pushing somebody else into a, a more attacking midfield role i don't know but just based on what what we have right now and the the particular talents of the players that we have that's what i would do so um the goals then mm mm i think we could leave leno discussion to part 2 because i've got some questions right uh about that but it was a bad mistake that was a bad yeah, mistake. Yeah, but it's going to happen, right? Like, we're going to get two of those a season, I think. And so are Man City. You know? Mm. like Liverpool have had a few out, of them already. Yeah, you play out from the back, you incur a degree of risk. As Arteta said afterwards, he demands it of the players. Mm. So it, it's going to happen. And, and actually, like, yeah, we'll, we'll come back on to Leno because like, I don't think it's the strongest dimension of his game. But... <laughs> It happened, and 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 everything that happened after that with him probably was a consequence of that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, what was a little bit more worrying wasn't so much the mistake itself, because I think, like you, it can happen um, with goalkeepers and the style that we play. But I was just maybe a little bit more concerned that it happened again, and mm. it happened again late on that one where he just booted the ball at Louise when he could have just cleared it out. So I think it was the fact that the the initial mistake got to him. Yeah, yeah. And, but to be fair to Leno, that's not usually the case. No, He's no, I who, agree. I agree. That's why I've, I just find it a little bit worrying. Yeah. I, I mean, with that, with any, any mistake playing out from the back, hmm. it always looks terrible for the guy on the ball. But actually, there has to be more of a collective responsibility. I mean... You know, there has to be more... There have to be people really pushing to make themselves available. And with the exception of Louise, who was very narrow and very near, I'm not sure there were massively. So, listen, I mean, uh, I have my... It's it's a mistake. It's Mm. definitely a mistake. But I'm kind of relatively philosophical about it. Maybe that's easier (laughs) because we won the game. Yeah, yeah, of course. I think if uh, if we hadn't, if we hadn't got those two goals, obviously there'd be a lot more focus on this. Uh, but we'll come back to Leno. We'll come back to him in part two. I'm just watching this again. I'm just watching it. Oh, no, I'm watching a guy shoot over. Um, one sec. Your, your brain always thinks when a goalkeeper makes a mistake like that, you always look at sort of the pass they were given. Was it on their wrong foot? Was it, you know, but I don't think that was the case in this instance. Yeah, I'm just watching that. Well, I'm watching think, them celebrate. I'm waiting for the replays to see exactly what happened. Yeah, because I think the TV cut to it late. Yeah. yeah, TV was showing a replay of a guy shooting over when Leno obviously took the goal kick. So he's standing there going, shit, shit. Um, this is not interesting podcast material, me watching replays. No, no. I'm surprised Back. it's not... Oh, that's just terrible. I'm so, yeah. There's no real mitigation there, I don't think. Um, yeah. Yeah, just a really bad mistake. Okay, we'll come back to Leno in, in part two. Um, our goals. Our goals. Well, I had a funny feeling David Luiz was going to score. I don't know what it was, but shortly after they scored, there was a we had a corner and the camera cuts Luiz in close up. Uh, and he looked very angry. And I thought, I quite fancy him here. And he didn't get on the end of that one, mm. but he did get on the end of the Pepe one. 
a, probably another goalkeeping mistake, to be honest, but a good delivery and a good header. Yes, I think that's the thing is it was, you know, look, the goalkeeper didn't cover himself in glory at all. But I think I, on the live blog, I said something like, oh, please, let's have a, how about one decent delivery, lads, is what I said. And then it was. It was a really good mm. ball in from Pepe. Um, you know, the goalkeeper, I don't think, makes that mistake without the ball that was played, if that makes mm. sense. You know, mm. uh, that that's what makes it difficult for goalkeepers or, or they think they can come for a ball. Um, so it was a great delivery, great uh, ball in from Pepe, decent header from Louise. Um, and then we have the second goal a couple of minutes later, um, Mosil. Yeah, defence splitting pass from Harry Elneny. Mm. I mean, actually, I feel kind of bad sort of being ironic about Elneny because he's been sort of nothing but pretty good since he came back from loan. Sure, but that's not the kind of thing he normally does, even though he did play quite a significant role in a goal recently as well, which I can't remember. I think it was. Was it Fulham? Maybe. Well, he did He did in one of the Fulham goals where he played a big crossfield pass. And I think there was another no, there goal. There was one on the edge of, of the box. That I'm yeah. yeah. Uh, home game. Yeah, and Aubameyang stepped over. It was, I think it was a Bellerin cross again. Everyone yeah. out there is going, it's the goal against you fucking idiots. Let me see. Not, was it I against Sheffield know. United? It could be. It's bad that we don't know. Sorry, everybody. Uh, we've it, only played was it, was it Saka's goal for. Sheffield United. I can't remember. Yeah, maybe it was. Let's say it was. Let's say it was. And people will correct us on Twitter if we're wrong anyway, so... Anyway, look, uh, basically, I know everybody thinks El Nenny's not very good, <laughs> but he is, okay, he, he, he is OK, and I don't mean that as a criticism. Like, in a Europa League game, he is absolutely fine as someone who can rotate into the midfield and do that job, it, it, in my opinion. Can't disagree. Can't disagree. Yeah. I mean, I think he is he is a Europa League squad player. That's yeah, what he is. I, and I, I think that he produced a really nice moment um, for Bellerin to cross for Aubameyang. And, and I think Bellerin deserves credit too for making that run. I mean, one of the sort of functions of the system we play in this game is that um, it kept Cedric playing in like quite a high attacking area. And uh, as I tweeted, finally, we have a formation that can unleash Cedric. But, you know, I think he was perfectly, as he always is, perfectly serviceable, but not very good. Uh, and I think Bellerin is very good in those areas. I, I'm, I am still sort of, I still sort of dissecting Arteta's comment during Project Restart. where He was like, you know, Cedric is our best uh, fullback in the final third. I still am like, did you mean that? Or was that just to sort of stop everyone banging on about how weird a transfer it was? Mm. Um, for me, it's it's not the case, and Bellerin is far superior. At that oh, end. I agree completely. I think Bellerin's a much better player. I have to say, though, there were a couple of early crosses in from Cedric, which were excellent, really, well, really good delivery. deliveries. Yeah, I think his striking of the ball is basically pretty good. I don't think his reception, his running, his ability to go in behind, I don't his dribbling, I don't think that's his kicking, better. his running, his jumping, <laughs> his, his tackling. Yeah, uh, none yeah, of those things yeah. are any good. Oh, all those like, other things. No, no, I mean yeah, he can cross the ball. He no. can cross the ball. He took corners in this game. Yeah. Um, which no. shows you yeah. they think something about his delivery. But I just think in a team that's crying out for penetration, um, Bellerin is much more penetrative as a runner. Sure. And to to circle back, by the way, on the sort of striker left wing thing, as I said, my ideal is a centre forward we don't have because I love that run that Ober can make for that goal. I love that diagonal and he's made it plenty of times and mm. they can't track it and he's, he's one of the best in the world at it. Mm. Equally, I accept we don't have that player and at the moment... Saka looks closer to being the winger we'd like than Lacazette looks clo- that looks yeah. to being the centre forward we'd like. Sure. So it, it is it is a it is a a case of you know we need we need to improve it we need to improve it and I and I don't think looking at the performances in this game of both Lacazette and Inketia that either of them look like the guy who's going to sort of imminently do that. No, that's for sure. So look. Uh... Bottom line, reasonable away win against 
probably the, the most difficult team in the group. Yeah. We had to use players we didn't want to use, but then, I mean, at least we took them. At least they were there. Yeah. Uh, at least we could. That is probably the toughest fixture one, you would think. Yeah. Um, and I think we really needed that last 20 minutes. I mean, it's a little bit reminiscent of the Sheffield United game, isn't it? In that, like, for 70 minutes or so, we weren't really doing it. We were all looking at this going, oh, this feels familiar in a really bad, troubling way. Sure. And then we kind of squeaked out of it. But I think to allay those concerns and allay those... I don't know, fears? It's fine yeah. to say fears. We need something much more convincing, don't we? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think people are beginning to get a little bit antsy about performance levels. Um, but, you know, we've got a couple of home games coming up now, which might um, and hopefully will uh, see us get on a little bit of a run or put some wins together. So people always feel better when we win. It's worth pointing out we're coming into this game off the back of a defeat as well, which sort of clouds True. your clouds your um not judgment but your perception of what you want the team to do because you sometimes really want them to say well we hated that defeat let's go out and smash a team four nil four nil five nil whatever it, whatever it was i have to say i caught like a tiny bit of the the pre-game stuff on bt right. where there was uh, martin keon was saying well i don't expect arsenal to even concede a goal here i think they'll win four nil five nil something like that and i was thinking really I didn't have that sense going into this. Like I would have taken a, a you know, a, a solid two nil, whatever it was. Um, sometimes I think we underestimate some of the opposition that we face. You know, I know there are teams in this Europa League group that we will be expected and rightly expected to score goals against. I'm not necessarily sure it was this team. Although when the guy on BT commentary said, and there is blah blah blah, currently on loan from Barnsley, I was like, oh, okay, maybe. When you're learning to play from Barnsley, it tells you the level a bit. I mean, yeah, I, I, I do think that I saw Martin Kian say that 4-0 and I thought, I don't know if that's realistic, Martin. I mean, I just don't think actually that we play in a way that I can kind of envisage that result occurring, kind of regardless of opposition. I mm. do just think that we are uh, conservative. I, yeah. I really do think that. And... You know, there, there, there have been mooted comparisons to the bad man, uh, <laughs> and I think I can understand some of that. But I think there are genuine causes for optimism here. I mean, yeah. what's happened defensively should not be discarded just because we're worried about the other end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think Gabriel had another good night. He was good. He's good. I like Party him. Party looks yeah. good. It's, it's, it, you know, it. it <laughs> The, the the core the spine of the team is getting stronger but to continue, sort of to mix it up from a house analogy mm. it's no good just having a spine you need arms and legs and a and a face and a staircase <laughs> yeah exactly okay before we move on i got a good email this morning from uh joshua platman who says hi andrew and james and all at ars blog blah 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 um says some nice things about the blog and the podcast so thank you very much indeed for that he said on to the main point of this email i've just finished watching arsenal's epic europa league comeback over rapid vienna it was mm. fantastically average yes it was he said <laughs> the best thing about it though were the subtitles that accompanied the stream i used here are some of the alternative names it gave the players. He says, yes, I took notes. It's like an old copy of Pro Evolution Soccer. So he gives some of the names, and these are some of the subtitles that appeared on the screen when those names were mentioned in commentary. So he starts with Kalasinac, who is also referred to as That's an Inch, Collateral, Alison Itch, Classic Match, Once Attached, and Glass Attached. <laughs> El Nenny. How many and male nanny? <laughs> wow, an alternative o career. Obama Yang, Bobby Young. <laughs> if, wow. I like that, Bobby Young. If that's a man, Obama Yang, a bomb again, and the family Young. <laughs> <laughs> Hector, that was our performance, a yeah. bomb again. <laughs> Hector Bellerin, thanks for bearing. Um, Thomas Partey, Thompson. Toxic, no but, and Thompson Center. Um, Pepe, no pay. Um, 
Stoikovic, who was referred to as stalker bitch or just <laughs> like a bitch. <laughs> yeah. And Arsenal keeper came out as hostile caper. So there you go. I saw some of those were really excellent. I really it like a, I really yeah. like Bobby Young. Bobby Young. I mean, I'm going to get that on the back of my shirt. Tattoo, uh, mate. Tattoo, Bobby and Young. And Bernd Leno definitely was on a hostile caper last night. Yeah. It seemed to me. It seemed to be. So anyway, thank you for that, Joshua. Thanks for the email. Um, we are going to take a little break here. We're going to come back in part two with your questions and more right after this. Welcome back to the Arsecast Extra. This is part two of the show where we answer questions that you send to us on Twitter at GunnerBlog and at Arsblog. Also on the Arsblog Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash the Arsblog and on the Arsblog Discord chat server, which you get access to if you are an Arsblog member on Patreon. Before we get into this, we are playing this weekend Leicester on Sunday night at 7.15. What a terrible time Weird. for a game on a Sunday, Weird. isn't it? It really yeah. is. Um, but there you go. Um it is on pay-per-view, of course, and we've discussed pay-per-view and people are aware that uh, this is going to cost fourteen ninety-five on top of your Sky or BT subscription, whatever you might have. Um, people have objections to this, of course. Um, it's a captive audience. I'm sure many people are going to pay that. But uh, one thing that has happened over the last week or so is that football fans have been donating to good causes as a kind of demonstration against pay-per-view. And I think uh, it's possible to pay for the game and also make a donation. But uh, a lot of people are doing that. Newcastle fans raised over £20,000 for a local food bank. And the mm. Arsenal Trust, Arsenal Supporters Trust, rather, uh, have done something similar, put in place a link where you can give to Islington Giving, which is a, an organisation that... that um, uh, donates to many good causes in the Islington area. So if you fancy donating the price of a pay-per-view game or whatever you can afford to that, there is a link in the show notes. You'll find that on your app or on arsblog.com. Or you can uh, just go to the uh, arsenaltrust.org uh, to their website. They've got all the details on there. So um, I, I think I saw yesterday there had been over seven or 8,000 pounds raised already yeah. from Arsenal fans, which is great. Um, and of course, it's in the focus this week uh, as well, given everything that's going on with um, Marcus Rashford and his uh, incredible attempts to combat child hunger and child poverty. Um, so whatever you can give uh, and you feel like you can contribute to that, uh, just follow the link and you can... Yeah, there you go. I don't know. Anything to add? And no need to pay for the pay-per-view anyway, because you can just follow the game on Meza Ozil's Twitter account. <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. Do you want do you want to start the questions? Yes, let's go first. Let's go with this question about Thomas Party from Frank Nana Ampon Jr. And Frank says, Party had his full debut last night. His numbers were amazing. Should he now be the first name on the sheet on match days, or should Mikel continue easing him into the starting eleven? No, play him. Play him straight away. He's he's uh he's got all the things that we want from a midfielder. He's got the experience. He's got the quality. He's got the uh, the physicality. He's got the, the technicality. He's got it all. So mm. why would we need to ease him in anymore? Like, I understand the Man City thing from the perspective of him only arriving at the club a couple of days before the game. I get that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he doesn't need to be... Uh, Molly coddled. He's 27 years of age. He has been there, done that for a team, with all due respect to us, better than us for the last yep, number of sure. years in Atletico Madrid. He's worked for an extremely demanding coach. And we think that Arteta is that kind of coach as well, albeit in his own way, slightly different from Diego Simeone. But what he wants and what he expects from his players is not going to be new. It's not any kind of culture shock for, for Thomas Partey. So I don't really see the need to, to sort of ease him in. Do you? No, I don't actually at all. Um, I think he should play from now on. I thought he was, like I say... A, it was a really excellent debut mm. and 
it's one of those debuts you I think people will remember because immediately it felt fresh and it felt like he was doing something that our other midfield players don't necessarily always do. You know, mm. he had that that separation, that athleticism, uh, the confidence. I really liked it. He had a lot of presence. Uh, uh, this is not at all a criticism or a caveat of that player. I'm really, really happy we've signed that player. But w- since he's come in, have you sort of thought of the two types of midfielder we could have bought? Are you regretful at all about the type that we went for? No, not regretful. I mean, I think I said on the podcast I would have liked uh, our because I, I, I fancy a player like that a bit more. You know, that's a personal thing. I like that kind of attacking midfield player. Mm. Um, mm. But I'm not blind to what Partey can bring to a midfield, which has been... I'm not going to say one dimensional, perhaps two dimensional, but without those dimensions being quite as good as they need to be, you know? Yeah. Um, And again, it's not to slag off any of the players that we have, but I think Partey can do more. He can do more in midfield than some of the players that we have. So I'm not regretful. I think he he improves us. He makes us better. He increases the quality of the the team. I think he gives us a few more options in midfield in terms of how we can set up the team. So I'm not regretful at all. Um, you know, I, I like what I've seen so far, early days, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, there's no, there's no need to just um, – play safe with this guy no I don't think he needs to be putting cotton wool at all really and you know I think next week I could expect him to not play the Europa game he should be playing the mm. Premier League games for us and I think that is what will happen yeah. to, to slightly rephrase my question uh, I suppose what I mean is sort of do you as much as we're all convinced that Mikel Arteta needs to make the most of the pieces that he has available to him do you still feel that in the composition of this team, there is a piece missing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I think there is. Yeah. I think we can all, I do as well. I think we can all see that. Um, But maybe, well, I just mean, maybe it was unrealistic for us to expect the club or the, the, uh, yeah, maybe the club to, to fix both those issues in one window. I mean, I think this is, this is a work in progress. Still, absolutely, you know, absolutely. and I think we have to sometimes step back and realize that that progress and what have you is very often incremental. It's very rarely do you come in and do everything all in one go. I mean, I don't want to keep harping on about Liverpool and Jurgen Klopp, but it took them a long time to get to the point where the final two pieces of their puzzle were Van Dijk and Allison. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Mm. Of course. And I I agree with you. I think, you know, it, it was never going to be a one summer job in which Arteta was going to suddenly have all the players that he'd want his disposal. And I, I'm not making excuses for him. I just think inevitably, you know, building a team in the transfer market takes time, especially in trying circumstances. My nagging worry, I would say, is that... Uh, while I do believe there are things we can do tactically and in terms of intention and all those things to improve ourselves as an attacking force, when I look at our Premier League rivals and sort of the leaps forward that they made in terms of their attacking games, sort of nine times out of ten, it felt like it was associated with signings. Um, a recent example would be Man United, for example, Bruno Fernandes, whatever. You know, effectively their front three is the same composition, but that one player seems to suddenly change the yeah. amount of attacking threat. Well, let's give Partey a bit of time. Yeah, maybe, true. maybe he could. I'm not saying he is like Bruno Fernandes. In a different way, maybe he could. Maybe that. he could. You know, but we don't. We obviously don't know yet. He's played his first game last night, um, and and how he's integrated and what he brings to the team at Premier League level over the next few weeks and months is going to be really interesting yeah. to see. So, Well, I mean, there was a great comment, Mikel Arteta after the game sort of said, you know, at times in the second half we were chasing and it felt like Partey was holding the midfield on his own. And you sort of want to butt in and go, well, yeah, that's fine. That's sort of what we bought him for. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah, know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, he, he could do that from the first minute in a way and that could allow us to be a lot more attacking, hopefully. Hopefully. 
Okay, here is a question from, uh, we have a couple on this actually, one from the Discord uh, from Ike SL, who says, should Reese Nelson be concerned that a centre forward in Eddie and Keddy is being preferred to him to play out wide? And should Eddie be concerned that he's not getting opportunities at centre forward with even Willian being preferred? While on Twitter, Joe, who's at red and white 11, says we've seen Eddie out wide a few times now. It clearly doesn't work. Can Reese Nelson feel hard done by that those minutes don't go to him? We've clearly lacked a creative spark, and he can provide that. Ideally, Pepe should do that too, but struggle in this game. But maybe that's a separate issue. Mm. Uh, I mean, I think Reese Nelson should be pretty concerned that Eddie and Kessie is starting that game on the left wing, and he's not, and he's coming on for a minute at the end. Mm. And, you know, I remember David Ornstein reporting that Reese Nelson was available for loan. And as far as I understand it, that remained the case until the deadline closed. Uh, and a suitable move was not found. And I think that is a substantial blow to Reese Nelson. I think he kind of needed that loan. I think for his development, it would have been really valuable. I think we'd be getting to look at him play Premier League football. At the moment, he's really, really struggling for minutes. And, mm. you know, it never feels like Arteta... I've never had the sense that he doesn't believe in Nelson or that he doesn't admire his talent or that he doesn't think there's a use for him. And he's, you know, been sort of unequivocally positive about him whenever asked. But I guess the proof is kind of in the pudding and he's not he's not picking him. Um, so I think that is a real concern. I mean, presumably you, you think he should be a bit worried too. Yeah, I mean, I think he he could be more worried if, for example, we play Eddie and Keddie on the left wing against Dundalk with the greatest of respect to my uh, countrymen, I think that might be a much bigger concern than a game against a more established, or a more established, but perhaps a a better team um, like Rapid. I think that would be, if he didn't get minutes in those games against Dundalk, against Mulder, if we'd played, um, let's say, lower division teams in the Carabao Cup, and he didn't get played, then, you know, he could be worried. But yeah, look, I I think this comes back to the square pegs, round holes kind of thing. The the yeah, yeah, the yeah. way Arteta sets up his team, maybe he views... I, I don't know. I don't know. Because I think there was a question on the, the Discord from Darth Gunner who says, why is Arteta so insistent on using a false nine and moving actual strikers wide left? I don't know, maybe he just likes it. I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing that I always think about that, and, and if when we control the ball, the, the, when we see Aubameyang stood out on the left wing, tracking back on the halfway line, it's when we don't have the ball. And that means that, as you pointed out against Man City, sometimes when we break in transition, he's not in the best position to mm. kind of be the option in behind. But in theory... If we control possession, you know, really where he should be is within the width of the 18-yard box, which in the last 20 minutes yesterday is predominantly where he was. And, you know, that that's the point, really, is that when when we have the ball, he, he absolutely shouldn't be stood out on the left flank. So I think the things kind of go hand in hand. I think we're not controlling games sufficiently to be able to kind of dictate mm. the shape and dictate where our players are. They're getting pulled back into that back five, and get, Aubameyang's getting pulled back onto left midfield because we haven't got the bloody ball. You know, we haven't had a 70% possession game or whatever you want to call it. So all these things are definitely interlinked. Um, I can't remember what my point was going to be about Reese Nelson. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So as you might have gathered from listening to this podcast, I'm not massively invested in Cedric's Arsenal career. And I have to say, looking at the quality of the opposition we face, although it's not his preferred position, I do wonder if, the, given what the job we asked to do, asked Cedric to do last night, it was basically playing in the final third, quite narrow at times. And I think Nelson could potentially do that from the right hand side. He's done it in the past. If we're looking to squeeze him in, he might mm. squeeze in there. Well, I had a question which might fit into this a little mm. bit. It comes from Tony Kent, who's at 2-0 down. 
given you're advocating something different than Cedric, which isn't Hector Bellerin. He says, mm. any thoughts on why Ainsley Maitland-Niles has been left out so often lately? Only played yeah. seven minutes from four games in October. And I, I get what you're saying about Reese Nelson, but I think if you're looking for somebody to do what... Um, yeah. To, to to play ahead of Cedric, that isn't Bellerin. Maitland Niles obviously stands out for me. So, any thoughts on what's going on there? Weird. I thought he'd play last night. So did I. He was at the he was the press conference guy and everything. I thought Bukayo Saka would be rested, uh, and I thought Maitland Niles would play that position. I have to say, and it worries me a little bit that we might try and play Saka again against Leicester. I think it's we're asking a lot of him. As I know he's great and he's young and blah, blah, blah. But we are, you know, leaning into his ability at the moment. I th- I do wonder if Maitland-Niles maybe will start at the weekend. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, do you think, do you think that him not playing last... It's weird, isn't it, to say, do you think he was left out of this game to keep him fresh for the game against uh, Leicester when, you know, he hasn't really played at all, so he's going to be as fresh yeah. as he like anyhow? He could have played both games or they could have shared the minutes or something, but, uh, yeah, I think it is weird. So, A, I think it's weird that he never... He, he did get a go on the right, didn't he? Was it against... Uh, who was it in the Carabao? We beat them 1-0 or something. To, or Pepe scored a... Leicester. It was Leicester. Yeah. Um, I know that, that wasn't the score, was it? But anyway, I didn't watch that game. But anyway, he played a right back in that. <laughs> he played a right back. I was away. He played it right back in that and apparently wasn't great. But I do think, of course, you know, I think he's a better option than Cedric in that position. I'd like to see more from there. I think he might play at left wing back against Leicester. And I think that if he does... If he does, that tells you about the respect that, that Arteta has for Leicester. I think mm. it also raises an interesting question of... Well, I'll, I'm curious to see where our chances come from, you know, without mm. Saka there. That would be my worry. Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, yeah, curious uh, to uh, see unless, what's going on. Yeah, unless Saka plays in the front three, in some, you know, as we've discussed, as a possibility. I mean, that would, that would certainly be interesting. Mm. Uh, okay, let's have a question. Let's do the obligatory Meza Ozil question. Uh, so this one is from uh, Jesse Oso on the Discord and Jesse says we're all bored of Messer talk but given we're unwilling to put him in a squad and he is happy to sit till the end of his contract why don't we just pay him out and move on it's the same outcome at this point I think the very simple answer is is that that is not what Mesut Ozil wants his agent Mm. has been pretty clear about that hasn't he for some time. For some time, like a long time. Mesut Ozil is going to stay until the end of his contract. He will stay to the end of his contract. There's no equivocation here. He's been consistent with that message for the last 18 months, at least, mm. you know, which tells you how long this thing has been going on as well. Um, yeah. So I just... I, 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 I think it's the writings on the wall that that's how it's going to play out. I really, really mm. do. I, I don't really see how, an alternative. How how do you view the situation, though? I mean, I know we're all fatigued by it. I think it's a really sad and ignominious end to the Arsenal career, a, a very talented player. Yeah. Um, you know, I thought Arteta this week spoke well about it, you know, um, he said all the right things. I think, yeah, I mean, you know. he said it was for football reasons, and some people believe him, some people don't believe him. I think he's been pretty upfront and honest about it. He owned the decision. He took responsibility for it. You know, the idea that that football reasons, I think, is a very broad um, term, right? Because mm-hmm. people hear, well, it's for football reasons, and they'll say, well, how can Mesut Ozil not be in the squad and you know, someone like Joe Willock is ignoring the fact that Joe mm. Willock isn't a foreign player or anything like that. It's not just about the talent of a player, is it? It's not just that, um, you know, Mikel Arteta thinks that, I don't want to keep using Joe Willock as an example, but, you know, that, that Mesut Ozil is less talented or has less ability than Joe Willock. It's not that. It's a more broad um, decision than just his technical ability or what he's done in the past, or his creativity and, and all that kind of stuff. 
But I mean, mm. I don't know if you saw this, but like this morning on the Ars blog, or Ars blog, on the Arsenal Facebook page, they have a, you know, a piece of hashtag content and it starts, uh, Mesut Ozil reacts to, or Mikel Arteta reacts to Mesut Ozil tweets during Rapid Vienna win. And it's our Germany international <clears throat> was active on social media during our UEFA Europa League win tonight. And as you said, the Mesut Ozil account was, um, was tweeting away. I didn't see any of it. Uh, but, you know, is it Mesut Ozil? Is it the social media team behind Mesut Ozil? Does that even matter? Is this what's is this what's going to happen for every game now? Well, everybody's playing nice, aren't they? You know, Arteta in his press conference was asked about the tweets. And he was like, that's great. You know, that's what we want from our players who are left out. Uh, and I'm sure that's... What a dig at Socrates that is. <laughs> I'm sure that's said slightly through gritted teeth, you know. But... Um, I think both sides have to be seen to be conducting themselves appropriately in the circumstances. No one wants to do anything wrong that could incur issues for them down the line. Um, and I think, yeah, it, it's a bizarre charade, really, yeah. that will play out. I think it is really a shame. I think it's basically a situation where everybody loses. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's much to be proud of on any side. Uh, and it's really ugly, to be honest. I, I I want it over and I want it gone, not because of a, a personal uh, slight against the player, but just because it's a really unpleasant, ugly, sort of risible almost situation to have attached to this football club. And I think there's responsibility for that on all sides. Um and I, I hope to God it never happens again. Yeah. But here we are with seven months left of this. and Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, know, and there'll be more, you know, there'll be more news stories. Well, there'll be, yeah, people were saying, well, look, he's out of the squad now. Mikel Arteta has made his decision and that will be that. At least we won't be asked uh, about Mesut Ozil anymore. And, <laughs> you know, the first game we play after that decision you know, his social media um, interactions are being brought up at the press conferences. So there's kind of no escape from it. Unlike yeah. you, I think it's really sad. I think it's a shame. I think it's, it doesn't look good for Arsenal. It doesn't look good for Mesut Ozil. Uh, you know, he's, you know, a, a kind of a superstar in world football who is sitting on tweeting about games that he should be playing in, mm. you know, or... Mm. Maybe he shouldn't be playing in Europa League games, you know, with the talent that he has. But you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, what is just, this? Yeah. I mean, what the, what is it? What is? I don't know. You know, it's just, it's it's just really bad. And I I think, I think it's got the potential to become, while as, as you're saying, everybody's nice at the moment. It's got the potential. And I see undercurrents of it on Twitter. Um, it's got the potential to become really toxic if it hasn't oh, I, already, you know. Um, and I think it's it's an, it's an unhealthy situation for the players, for Mesut Ozil, for Mikel Arteta, for the football club. As you say, nobody's winning. Nobody is winning here. And no, and the I'm, thing about it is, it's not. It can't be a surprise to anybody that this has happened the way it's happened. Not Ozil, not Arteta, not Ozil's agent, not the club. I just don't understand why there hasn't been a greater effort or more effort to just resolve this in the background. I agree. I agree. And 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 from the exterior, you know, I feel like there's been a lot of pride on all sides and pride can be quite a damaging thing at times. And, I, I you know, it feels like a situation that's become about the winning of it, you know, and I, I kind of think... There's, there's so much else at stake that's probably more important. Mm. So, yeah, it, it's uh, just... It's catastrophic, I think, for the player. It's catastrophic for Arsenal Football Club, certainly, in terms of what we have paid Mesut Ozil across this period, the fact that we've got no real use out of him. I mean, you know, for a club with our resources, that it, that is truly disastrous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know, it, it, it's a, it's just a bewildering thing to see happening. I mean, 
you know, I know it's not completely isolated in world football, but this feels like a particularly pronounced example. And I think more things will come up between now and the end of the season. We're two months away from another transfer window. Yeah. We're two months away from Arsenal being able to register players again. You know, every time he is omitted from something, uh, you know, every time last week it was the match day squad. Last season it was the match day squad, but this season it'll be you know, oh they haven't ch- chosen to re-register him or blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it will roll on and on and on, and hopefully it will come to an end next summer. Um, well, certainly the professional relationship will. Yeah, yeah. I don't think he's getting an extension, James. No, no. I just think if Cedric's on that sweet four-year <laughs> deal. <laughs> There's got to be a chance. We're looking for somebody who can do what Listen, Cedric if does, but got better. Three years. <laughs> oh my god! In a world where Williams got three years, I think you mess it. You know, aim for two. See what see what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like this one from the Discord from Jez Box, who says, "Cedric versus Lichtsteiner. What's the difference apart from a four-year contract?" Ouch! Ouch! Okay. I think. Do you know what? I think Cedric's better than Lichtsteiner was. I'll I'll, I'll give him that. Well, Lichtsteiner was forty-five. Um, so there you go um, okay our friend uh, East Lower at East Lower says on a scale of not very Arsenal to very Arsenal indeed how Arsenal is it that despite having a wide array of backup defenders midfielders and attacking players the one player currently having the biggest wobble is the one with the least backup he is referring of course to Bernd Leno and what happened to him last night and uh, as a, an aside to that Ashley Moss who's at yeah. Ashley Moss 4 says how bad must Runerson be Well I think Runerson's quite bad <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean the stats say he's bad his career history says he's quite bad um so he's probably quite bad Right. Wouldn't you think? Uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, like, he's probably fine. Do you know what I mean? Like, he's probably, like, Cedric or something. Like, he's probably absolutely fine, but he's not going to be number one, is he? He's not going to... No, no. Uh, he's not at Leno's level or close to it. Um, so let's just h- hope he never has to play, is basically my opinion on that. Uh, and, and maybe he will play. Maybe he'll play, like, I don't know one of the Dundalk games or something. I don't know. Maybe they will chuck him in. I, I don't think I can blame the lack of competition for Leno's mistakes. I mean, I know, you know, he, he is the number one. He was the number one. He always will be the number one. Um, what, was he Was he concerned or worried about his place as number one when Emmy Martin prior, is... Exactly. No, no. Uh, was there before the lockdown. Prior to his injury, it's not like what was keeping Leno on his toes was that we all were chomping at the bit, hoping Martinez got a start. Yeah. Um, hardly. It was kind of a similar situation to what it is now. It felt like a very clear number one, albeit Martinez was playing cup games and doing absolutely fine. Um, I think he just had a bad night, you know? I think he. I think he made that mistake and... He was nervy from that point on um, and a bit agitated. I don't think he's brilliant with the ball at his feet. I don't think, uh, you know, sorry to invoke his name, but I mm. don't think he's got the ability of, of Martinez with the ball at his feet. Partic- you know, uh, he doesn't have the confidence. He might gain that. Probably mm. won't. Probably, like, this is who he is at this point, And he'll, you know he'll sort of get away with it most of the time and there might be the occasional error. But I'm not, you know, I'm not hashtag Leno out or anything like it. Yeah. What do you make of the situation with the lack of competition? Well, like I said, I don't think Leno was particularly worried about Emmy Martinez. No, he was Before... Um, I don't, to be honest, it doesn't sound like he was worried at any point, does it? But, yeah. No. Um, what do I think? Yeah, I mean, I don't really think it's an issue... Per se, I think the issue is not so much the lack of competition, but the lack of depth. That if something does happen to Leno, we're relying on a goalkeeper who lost his place at Dijon to come in and play at Premier League level and be really good. You know, was there a reason why, James, we were chasing uh, David Raya? 
all summer and kept making bids that kept getting be, uh, being rejected. There mm. must have been a reason. So... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, and, you know, even once Renaissance was done... Arsenal hadn't completely abandoned hope of getting right. So does that not suggest that Runison was brought in as potentially the third choice goalkeeper on the premise that Matt Macy was going to leave and we were looking at David Raya for... I think so. Yeah. I think so. And, um, you know, I I reported this after the transfer deadline, but there is a clause in David Raya's contract which comes into action next summer with a minimum fee... So it would not surprise me at all if Arsenal returned to that. Mm. But in the meantime, um, yeah, we are we are lacking we are lacking competition for Leno. But I, I personally don't have a massive problem with that. I want Leno to play all the Europa League games and all the Premier League games. Mm. Uh, that's what I want. Um, yeah, I don't want right to know how bad how bad Arsenal is. Uh, and if he t- t- turns out to be brilliant, I will absolutely take my hat off to it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and he'll be like, oh, that's fine. Now you've taken your hat off. We're even. Um, Put your hat back on. I can't look at your head. How about that? That's what he'd say. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. I need a question. You do. Have you got a question to hand? Because I, you've asked two questions that I had prepared. Oh, okay. Uh, Kerem Tosun, who's at Kerem underscore Tosun, says... I feel some fans have already forgotten that Arteta's led us to an FA Cup and European football only months ago. Do you think that in today's age of 24-7 sports media, the time frame in which we appreciate success has lessened dramatically? 100%. I I was going to do a tweet this week where I was going to, I couldn't quite get the wording right, but it was like, do you remember the good old days? Remember the old days when everything was great back in August when we won the fucking FA Cup? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And then the Community Shield. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh those the blissful times, days. the days of your, the halcyon days. Uh, you, could, you could six weeks ago. Yeah, you could go out. You could leave your door unlocked, leave your bike in the front yard, and nobody would steal it. I know. Um, yes, I think the pace of dissatisfaction is remarkable. I really, really do, and I think um, it's all it's emphasised by the fact that. There are no crowds currently mm. and all of the fan experience lives online through social media. That's a really good point. Because I think yeah. Tim Tim Stillman often makes the point that um, the reaction in the ground or, or the way that fans react to things inside the ground or many fans that go to games don't live on social media 24-7. And I think when you, when you, and I'm not sort of ignoring the fact that we're on social media and we do podcasts and we talk about the game and we, we're part of it. I'm not ignoring that. But I do think that when, when you're discussing the same thing over and over and over again, day in, day out, I'm not, I'm not saying that's what we're doing, but I, I know that some people, and I'm not saying this to be critical, I think it's true of, of many football fans, they can get laser focused on one particular issue mm. and they sort of extrapolate things from that issue which aren't necessarily there. I think when you you go over and over and over one thing or two things, it becomes a much bigger thing than it actually is, if that makes sense. Yeah, and before you know it, Arteta's Emery. <laughs> but no, I, I, that, I, I think it's... It, it does perpetuate that sort of analysis. And, and, I, and I don't think the analysis is, is inaccurate. So, for example, the criticisms of Arsenal that we have and that others have at the present time are absolutely valid, I think. You know, like the lack of attacking yeah. power and penetration. I think that's absolutely correct and valid. I do think that maybe the nature of online discourse is it sort of accelerates the speed at which that develops into de- dissatisfaction, you know, or like mm. unhappiness. Sure. Um, and it changes our kind of time scale of what is acceptable development. Because, uh, you know, you're right. It was weeks ago that we were all extremely happy with the direction that we were taking. That said, we were also saying at the time, there's a different challenge this season. And the challenge is to, you know, dominate certain yeah. games and be more of an attacking force. It's an interesting one. 
Because also, you know, you're right that, that, that there is a, always a divergence between the way the fans in the ground feel and the way the fans on social media feel. But then there's a lot more fans on social media than there are in the ground. So, you know, it's yeah. uh, weighing those two things against each other is really tricky. Yeah, I mean, I think if you'd said to people at the arse end of the Emery era, if we if we are where we are a year later under Mikel Arteta, would you take it? Most people would have taken it because, you know, there's progress. We've won a trophy. We got back into Europe despite the Premier League season being uh, bad. You know, we've uh, re-signed Aubameyang. We've signed up Saka. We brought in Partey. We brought in Gabriel. You know, we've done things that I think people would have been really happy with if you'd laid sure. it out in front of them and said it. And all the time, you know, the idea that it is a work in progress. It takes time to get things right. All of those are common sense uh, statements that people can get on top of and on board with. And they say, yes, absolutely. It takes time to build a team. It takes time to put things right. It takes time to imprint your style on a club. It takes time to, you know, even some of the the, the stuff about... Um, how will I put this? People have wanted a manager at Arsenal who who is ruthless, right? Yeah. They want these things. Sure. We've got one of these, and now they don't like some of the ruthlessness, which is fair enough. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, you know, people can react the way they react to certain things. But at the same time, you know, did this long term or medium term outlook in football, which is sensible and that everybody can see the rationale in, is every three days out the window because there's a game. You know, it's Absolutely. hard to, to to marry the two things. The acceptance yeah. that I can see it's going to take time to get us back to where we want to be. It's not an overnight thing. It won't happen overnight. Uh, you know, otherwise it would just be a miracle. So it's going to take us a while to get there. Absolutely. Fuck, why did we play that way against that team and not do that? You know, that's what that's yeah, yeah. just the reality of of football and the the I'm not going to say just the online experience but the experience of fans and and the way uh, football is discussed and analyzed these days yeah, there's no escaping it, is, it it's all it's all football fans it's us as well it's a struggle to take kind of a macro view of things you look at it game by game once you've latched on to a problem it becomes kind of you know you, you fixate on it you see it every game and you don't sit back and go well, where were we six months ago and where are we now? Mm. You know, it's, it's very, 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 very difficult to, to do for anybody. Um, and yeah, I, I agree. I think that the, the task for Mikel Arteta, obviously, is to improve the team, to get top four, to make us a better attacking force. Mm. But on that final point, I think that the real challenge for him is to know and sense, maybe better than us, at what point to implement these evolutionary steps sure and he has to hold his nerve almost to be like now i know i know actually we're not quite yet there to make that leap or we're not quite there to make this leap and you know we might be sitting on the sidelines and going come on push it we need to you know push the button we need to do it but i'm hoping that my interpretation of the situation and my hope is that he shares those frustrations, he shares those goals. He just has a different sense of the timeline. Mm. Um, and that's his job, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's our job to to worry about it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, look, we've got time for one more question. I've got one here. Unless, okay. uh, um, it comes from Be Well at Skipper AFC. He says, firstly, is the tie-dye shirt the most revolting thing you've ever seen? Secondly, what is the worst thing Adidas could sell people uh, that people would still pretend is lovely? <sighs> what is the worst thing Adidas could sell people? Well, no, firstly, is the tie-dye shirt the most revolting thing you've ever seen? Um, It's not great. It's uh, not great. What do you think? Uh, I mean, you hate bluey kits anyway. Mm, am, am I right to, to think that um, this was designed by Pharrell? Is that correct? I think I think so. Wow. Uh, I saw his name actually referenced in regards to it, so maybe that is right. Arsenal Pharrell. Hum- oh, well, uh, I don't know he designed it, but apparently it's his um, project, Human Race. Pharrell Williams designed Human... Well, 
At least oh, he, I'm yeah. sorry. I've just realised what they're talking about. So is this the pre-match jersey? No. It's this new jersey that's doing the rounds. Which one? Not the one we played in last night. No. Have a look at the... Have a look at Arsenal.com right now. The thing right that Aubameyang's wearing, and it's like yeah. yellow and blue. Yeah. I'll tell you now, oh, I don't you, mind it. Ah, I knew it. I don't mind it. It's got, you know, a bit of banana hue to it. I'll take it all day long. Mm. So the answer is, I will clearly buy anything Adidas put out. I thought we were talking about the blue kit. No, 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 no. This is the, the, the thing. Which has that... a similar sort of tie-dye squid ink effect on it mm. be in darker colours um, yeah I mean that sort of looks like a, a bruised banana kit that's sort of gone funny in the wash doesn't it this new tie dye thing it's a bit it's not for uh, me I have to say no no it, think, do you know what tie dye reminds me of I don't know if you remember this do you remember the t-shirts that you, that came out um, I think it must have been in the 80s so maybe you don't maybe they still had them in the 90s I don't quite remember but but when you put them on as you got warm, they would kind of change colour and shit. Do you remember those? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's that sort of vibe, isn't it? Yeah, it's not great. I. So I'm um, sorry, Pharrell, I'm not particularly happy with this. What I will say generally is that Arsenal produced a fair bit of yellow merchandise because of the old bruised banana. Yeah. But yellow is a difficult colour for uh, quite a white, pasty man to wear. <laughs> you just sort of look. I mean, I'm, lo- I'm looking at a picture of Aubameyang in it. And he looks great. But I just would sort of be washed out. Yeah, it's all about that. the model, isn't it? Really is. I think so. Um, wh- what's the worst thing they could make that people would buy? Probably one of those changing colour shirts like you just mentioned. Yeah, I reckon they could do like a, a shirt, the design of which is William Gallas sitting on the ground at Birmingham City that time. Yeah. Uh, throwing the fucking tantrum of all tantrums. And what they would do is they would say, well, actually, the design of William Gallus is made up from thousands of tiny little Ian Wrights wearing the bruised banana shirt. And it's part of our heritage and history. And people would go, oh, give me one. I got to get one. Yeah. I reckon they, they do could a do a good all... enough advert for yeah, it. Exactly. They could do like the worst moments in Arsenal's history, but they'll just say like, oh, uh, this is Almunia being beaten at the near post in the Champions League final. But we designed it using a paintbrush made from Dennis Bergkamp's pubes. <laughs> and people will be like, yeah, oh, got to have one of those. Get me one. <laughs> I mean, uh, if, that would, if they made that available, I'd be first in line. I have no doubt about that. I have no doubt about that. I do think that tie-dye thing would go well with your grey track, pa- uh, track pants, though. That's true. I mean, come on. Mm. It's a whole look. You've got to remember. And what about Dennis Burkamp's son, by the way, turning up in the academy? You've seen that story? I did see that. How old is he, though? He's like 26. 22. <laughs> yeah. He's 22. He's, an und- he's a, a diamond in the rough, an undiscovered gem. Oh. I just like the idea that we're is sort this... of getting the band back together. You know, Edu's son, Burkamp's son. Is, They're is, all hanging out. Is Burkamp's uh, son's first name a Maori? <laughs> uh, if it is it might help him get a contract a Mary Bergkamp PI alright well we'll see what happens there um, I think we should leave it there um, we've got Leicester on Sunday evening of course so um, fingers crossed for that one we'll be here to talk about it on Monday in the Arscast Extra so as ever thank you for being here thanks for listening have a great weekend keep fingers crossed for the three points on Sunday and we will catch you on the next one bye bye <laughs>